When you're trying to win awards in Hollywood film circles, you see a lot of films showcasing the same angles. Sad or tear-jerky material, racially charged or challenging content, or how a woman and a fish can have sex. Yet in this chase for awards, very few films stop to take a long, hard look at themselves and say, maybe I'm not actually that smart. Maybe this plot makes no sense and that asking the audience to read into everything I present is actually going to alienate me from the viewers. Maybe I should look up fish sex when I get home and realize that the male just crop dusts the shit out of the female's eggs. Anyway, Anyway, so what we've done today is a little jokey list taking the piss out of films that took themselves a little too seriously or try to tell a message that's just not as deep as they want you to believe. With this in mind, I'm Jules from WhatCulture.com and these are 8 movies that weren't as smart as they thought. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to stay notified. Ding, ding, done. Hey guys, before you get stuck into this rather meaty list, I just want to talk to you about That Film Theory, which is a brand new channel that we're starting up pretty soon. It's going to take on the form of kind of like relaxed video essays, posing questions, theories, and hopefully finding some answers. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in, then you can click up here to find some details or down below to find even more. Number 8. Hoodwinked is face-punchingly smug. Shrek did a lot for the animated movie genre. Weird to say, I know, but it was so accessible to kids and adults that it became a cash juggernaut. A slew of movies tried to follow suit, amongst which was Hoodwinked, which gathered a bit of steam by advertising itself as a post-modern fairy tale. <laughs> It's meant to be Little Red Riding Hood as imagined by Quentin Tarantino, or rather somebody who saw Reservoir Dogs a couple of years ago and can just about remember the plot. But it just doesn't have the commitment Shrek had to its characters. Yet that didn't stop it from being more smug than Adam Cleary is on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm not saying the film was a failure, but what it tried to be versus what it is is very different and in many places is just wince-inducing. Number 7. Psycho 1998 proves the opposite of what it sets out to show. The question that always arises with remakes is, what's the point in regurgitating the same thing? Especially if it's going to be a shot-for-shot -shot remake, and especially, especially, what's the point of attempting this with a Hitchcock film? No, no, you leave that alone. Now, here's the thing, the 1998 version of Psycho was created to, air quotes, show the audience how changing the actors can affect a story loved by the public. The real problem this film has, besides being made in the first place, is that the actors within it are doing such a hard job to replicate the original characters that it becomes all the more transparent that they are not the original characters. Also, the film changes a fair amount of scenes, including the murder moment, so you can't even call it a shot-for-shot -shot remake. Waste of time. Number 6. American Hustle tries to be more than it tells us it is. 2014's American Hustle didn't have quite the depth you'd expect from a film with such generated buzz. The cinematic adaptation of Abscam, sort of, which was an FBI investigation that used con men to nab corrupt officials, the film kicks off by telling us that some of this actually happened, and for vast stretches commits to that ethos. David O. Russell is an actor's director and allows for relentless interplay between the characters that ensure that none feel like cutouts. That's all we really want from a character study, but at times American Hustle forgets that and goes for something more. From De Niro's cameo to the Goodfellas slash casino aping voiceover, this feels like an expose style of 90 Scorsese, which it obviously isn't. The only probing question about the plot that we're actually left with is why didn't they finish the ice fishing story? Number 5. The Saw series thinks it's a morality tale. The weird thing about the makers of Saw is that even as time went on and their films became gorgasm exploitation films, they still believed that they were crafting morality tales. Admittedly, the first film does put forward a good case for Jigsaw attempting to enlighten his victims to the beauty of life, but by the third or fourth it had just become a justification for increasingly horrific moments. That's made all the worse by the chosen victims, whose crimes become as increasingly questionable in meriting such severe punishment. Also, we're forgetting that Seven did this whole killer teaching you a lesson thing a whole lot better, and we also need to draw in how Tobin Bell rewrote a lot of his dialogue as the films went on to make Jigsaw sound more like a messiah. That would be all well and good, but my god is it like self-fellatio by the end films. It's like, we get it, mate, you're a clown or something, right? By the way, I actually still enjoy these films, but they just aren't as deep as they think they are. Number 4. Ocean's 12 flat out lies to you so it can surprise you. A character played by Julia Roberts looks like Julia Roberts. That is a key plot point in Ocean's 12, and I cannot abide by this plot point. As much as the draw in seeing Brad Pitt and George Clooney suave their way through an adventure, the Ocean's films survive on their plots being the balance of whip-smart and cheerily smug. Here, though, it felt like a Saturday morning f***ing cartoon, ridiculous and smug, which just doesn't work unless it's me. 
The whole Julia Roberts clone thing aside, the film lies to you and sets up a reveal that's so disappointing. The Fabergé egg twist. Set up as impossible to steal due to incredibly high security, we learned that the Night Fox stole it because he could dodge security lasers, which had only been set up by the fact that he'd been shown that he loved a bit of yoga. Plot twists like this con themselves into thinking they're smart films, but it's just a cheap rug pull. Number three, Cop Out makes the audience laugh at it, not with it. Cop Out comes courtesy of Kevin Smith, although according to him, the film was utterly bastardized by the studio. Even if that's true, it doesn't make the film any less foul. Within 10 minutes, we get to see Tracy Morgan act out famous movie scenes while Bruce Willis drolly says the film's title. Intended to be a sly in-joke about Willis's past and action movies in general, it actually comes across as so ham-fisted. I've never seen that movie. We get it. The man was in Die Hard. We, we get it, Tracy. Stop. Tracy. Tracy, stop. T Jesus Christ. Tracy, stop. Stop. Whoa. Tracy, stop. And you know what? This scene is pretty much the movie in general. It acts like a parody, but instead of letting the jokes sit, it just announces them. And no one likes it when you have to explain the joke to them. Number two, The Box takes a B-movie idea and says it has weight. The Box is deviously simple when it comes to its plot. A normal couple has given a box sporting an enticing red button. If they press it, they get a million dollars on the proviso that a random person they don't know will die. Naturally, they push the button and the film eventually ends with a perpetuating loop. The wife is killed when another couple in the chain decides to push the button. That's the concept of the box, which should really be called the button, now I think of it. However, while that is its concept, it's not the plot, which throws in so many things to pad out the runtime that it becomes confusing and bloated. The film wants to talk about aliens, experiments, lightning, and other factors so much so that it misses out on delivering on its premise. Confusing your audience does little to endear them to your tale, especially when the core idea is as simple as a square. And number one, the Tree of Life is too generalized to raise real questions. So the thing with the Tree of Life is that it's a film from a director who loves to create challenging work, and it's not a bad film by any stretch, with some people actually hailing this as the best work in Malick's career. However, there are people out there who utterly hate this film, and I can see why. The creation of the universe segment comes out of nowhere and just leaves with little impact. The ending is just a tired purgatory scene that's ripped straight out of f***ing Lost, and the best section with Brad Pitt in doesn't have a satisfying resolution. This is the pinnacle of a film that thinks it's deeper than it is. It's confusing, frustrating, and despite the content, feels so thin that it could be cut way the hell down, which would help with its massive runtime. And we have to look at the reaction this film receives. Critics poured over every frame searching for the meaning, and the public chastised it for being beautiful, but way too pretentious. Which side do you fall on? Hey guys, before you go, I just wanted to talk to you about a brand new project that we're going to have starting up pretty soon. It's a brand new channel called That Film Theory, the pace of which is going to be a bit more relaxed and focus on kind of video essays on our favourite cinematic experiences. If that sounds like something that you're interested in, then click the screen and go over there. Hopefully we'll see you soon. We're passionate about it, so come support us.